Great. So we are recording now. We are live. And um, we'll wait for some folks to come in who are yeah. hopefully reasonably uh, punctual. But it is great to see all your smiling faces. Hmm. Caroline, where, where are you based? Are you in Washington? I am. I'm with the uh, US EPA in DC. Uh, we're in DC. My office overlooks the Washington Monument. That's great. Oh, Washington, that's, that's great. Yeah, great yeah. location. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you have seen the <laughs> the 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 the, the <clears throat> uh, uh, attack on the Congress. Right. Although we've been teleworking for two years, so oh, okay, in, in I, you are not there. For the last so there are carbon emissions. Well, guys, I, I think what we should do is go ahead and, and start. Yeah, um, you should start. And, and, um, you should start. Yes, and, and and then we'll ask them to edit it so it starts now in terms of, of the recording. So uh, welcome uh, everyone uh, to our session, which is really about going from uh, waste to circularity. In fact, the, the title of our session, uh, Recycling Approaches to Consumption and Waste, really is a little bit of a play of, of, uh, on words, where I think we have had in the past uh, practices uh, that are more circular, that are more sustainable, oftentimes because of resource constraints. So in some ways, I think we need to recycle ideas we've had in the past, as well as recycle ideas uh, from other parts of the world. Uh, so we can learn from uh, all parts of the world, particularly those that have uh, significant resource constraints. Um, and this is the way to be uh, more uh, efficient, uh, to decouple uh, prosperity from consumption, and at the same time, uh, reduce impacts to climate, which fortunately has the world's attention. Uh, another thing that has the world's attention right now, of course, is plastic waste, uh, particularly ocean plastic waste. And while that is perhaps a, a small part of the overall uh, waste challenge, it can be used as a model uh, for how we can address the overall waste challenge and look for ways to uh, dematerialize uh, um, services from their, from their products. Um, so I like to say that if we had a movie about our session, uh, we could, instead of calling it Back to the Future, we can call it Forward to the Past. Uh, so learning again from our, our past experiences. And I've had a long past in the area, uh, starting with uh, the Resource Conservation Recovery Act in 1976 and all of its uh, amendments and updates. Uh, and even though that sets a great title, it's like, yes, it's about resource conservation or recovery had, had you know, the best of intentions. It ended up being more end of pipe. Uh, and we had another initiative like the Pollution Prevention Act of 1990. We we're trying to get ahead of things, and that kind of fell uh, a bit flat. Uh, and throughout my career, I've been really focused on um, how do we deal with waste and the pipe, municipal solid waste? How do we recycle that? How do we address uh, industrial waste? And moving from that end of pipe framework to more of a uh, circular uh, framework and um, what uh, I'm doing uh, currently is again, working with circularity such as uh, the SDGs goals, where as we look at decoupling prosperity from, from consumption, how can we meet all of our societal goals? So the drivers uh, for this and perhaps any other question uh, can be said to be a policy, collaboration, innovation, and investment. Uh, and we have all those points of views here. So we're very fortunate in that. So we're gonna start off with Carolyn who is at the top of the heap, as it were, of the waste policy program in the United States at the US EPA. Carolyn? Great, thanks. So hello everyone, and thank you for having me on the panel today. Uh, my name is Carolyn Hoskinson. I'm with the United States Environmental Protection Agency. I'm the director of the Office of Resource Conservation and Recovery. Uh, also could be called EPA's waste office. So my office at EPA works on managing waste from cradle to grave, meaning we look at materials throughout their entire life cycle to ensure they're properly managed, both hazardous waste and non-hazardous waste. Mm. I've been at EPA for over 30 years now, 
and the wastes that we've been addressing in the country have obviously changed over the last 30 years, as has our understanding of the impacts of managing materials and the environmental and human health impacts of extraction, production, and we're now shifting our focus from that linear way of thinking about things, produce, use, and dispose, to a more sustainable, more circular approach to materials. So I'm really happy to talk today about several of EPA's efforts to promote a circular economy for all. I want to emphasize the words circular and for all, and I'm going to talk about both of those topics in a minute. 2021 was an extraordinary year for legislative action in this area. We were fortunate enough to launch the National Recycling Strategy Part 1 in Building a Circular Economy for All on the same day that President Biden signed the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. Both of those happened on November 15th, which perfectly was America Recycles Day. So the National Recycling Strategy highlights the actions needed by governments, by industry, and by others to really transform our recycling system, to address climate change, and to reduce the environmental impacts of materials extraction, use, and disposal on already overburdened communities. I want to encourage everyone to visit our website to read the strategy. We also have opportunities for people to sign up to stay connected to us, to continue to hear about the work that we're doing. And we even have an area on our website for those who are interested to sign up and let us know that you'd be interested in leading or supporting one of the many objectives in our strategy. And I'll be happy to make that website available um, to folks who are interested. So, When I said before, I would get back to the topic circular. I wanna share that when I was a child, my dad was an economics professor. And so as a young girl, he would talk to me about how supply and demand make the world go round. In our recycling system currently, we have a supply that is not matched by the demand. So first of all, a lot of discarded materials are not readily recyclable, making them a not particularly useful supply for the recycling system. We also collect a lot of materials that are contaminated, which again, make them a complicated supply to recycle. And the demand just isn't matching the supply at this point. So our national recycling strategy focuses on five objectives, improving markets, increasing collection and improving infrastructure, reducing contamination, enhancing policies and programs to promote circularity, and standardizing measurement and improving our data collection. It focuses currently on municipal solid waste recycling, which we know is only part of the story to address the full impact. So to talk about climate for a minute, the United Nations International Resource Panel concluded, this amazes me every time I say it, that natural resource extraction and processing contribute to half of global greenhouse gas emissions. In addition, in 2019, Ellen MacArthur Foundation reported that applying circular strategies to five key materials could reduce greenhouse gas emissions equal to cutting current emissions from all global transport to zero. These five materials include cement, aluminum, steel, plastics, and food. That's why EPA is addressing additional strategies to identify the key actions that are needed for these materials. Recycling alone is simply not enough. That's why we've set off a transformative vision for our waste management system. We know that specific materials need their own focus, which is why we're releasing additional strategies. Later this year, we'll be taking comment on our food and organic strategy and also on our plastic strategy and soon we will begin stakeholder engagement to develop an electronics and critical mineral strategy. Um, One of the things I want to mention about critical minerals is this is also an important priority of the Biden administration and one where we think recycling can have an important impact on the availability of critical minerals. All these future strategies will be put out in draft form and we'll be looking for public input and engagement on those strategies. So I said I would come back to for all. Um, Environmental justice is also an incredibly high priority for the Biden administration right now. And with the support of EPA Administrator Michael Regan, 
my deputy admin, assistant administrator, Carlton Waterhouse, and the support of the White House itself, we are really working very hard at EPA to make environmental justice an inherent part of all the work that we do. And so our strategies are really looking at the impacts of materials management on communities uh, and what we need to do to address past injustices that waste management has created on a number of communities. So when we developed the strategy, we reached out to EJ leaders to get their input on the draft strategy. And we very much want to work with community leaders as we implement the strategy to make sure we address those impacts on communities. So another minute I'll mention about the bipartisan infrastructure law um, that was signed on the same day as our strategy. We were very excited to receive infrastructure funding for recycling. We were asked to work on several different things, which we're very excited about. We have a new solid waste infrastructure for recycling grant program that we're developing. Also a new grant program on education and outreach about recycling. Um, and two programs with regard to batteries, voluntary labeling program, and a battery recycling best practices program. There were lots of other things we were asked to do in that infrastructure law, like develop a toolkit for communities on recycling, to work on procurement guidelines for federal purchasing of products with recycled content. Um, so lots of exciting things coming out in our work under the infrastructure law. We're also gonna be doing significant stakeholder engagement on that work as well. So again, on our website where we have the stay connected option for people to stay connected with us, you'll be able to find out about our, our engagement on that work as well. So let me toss it back to the panel. Great, thanks, Carol. That, that was great. And again, it's, it's so uh, refreshing to see the, the systemic view that, that the government's taking, uh, particularly around um, environmental justice or EJ, as you say, um, and looking at the, the social and economic impacts of, you know, again, doing the right thing of recycling, but understanding that's another industrial activity. So I'd like to hand it over to uh, Paul, who I've had the pleasure of knowing for, for many years and who is a leader uh, across environmental topics, including circularity. Thanks, Bill. And Carolyn, thanks so much for that overview and the updates of, uh, of your great work in uh, just south of our border here in Canada. So my name's Paul, I'm Managing Director of Circular Economy Leadership Canada, which is an initiative, a not-for-profit initiative that was launched in 2018 at the G7 Ocean Summit here in Halifax on the eastern coast of Canada. I'm actually out in British Columbia, so just north of uh, the border from Seattle where Bill's based. Um, the CLC, we're a network of corporate leaders, of, of nonprofit think tanks and academic researchers, and we're really focused on supporting the transition to a sustainable, prosperous or circular economy here in Canada. But we work um, very much as a bridge to similar organizations uh, and networks around the world. So Ellen MacArthur Foundation and the World Business Council and PACE and a number of others that are that are focused in this area. We uh, provide thought leadership and technical expertise, collaborative platforms to, to support that systems change that's needed. And as Bill said, those sort of four key drivers are so critically important for rethinking the way our, our systems work. Um, CLC was responsible for helping launch the Canada Plastics Pact in uh, January of last year. There's a U.S. Plastics Pact and other global pacts that are part of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's new plastics economy framework that are all working towards four common goal areas to reduce uh, plastic waste in the environment and recapture the value of those important materials. We also helped to bring the World Circular Economy Forum to North America for the first time in uh, September of last year, working very closely with the, with uh, Citra from Finland and our federal government, Environment Climate Change Canada, and we're one of the key sort of program partners. Uh, so lots happening in Canada, I would say, um, but part of our you know drivers are a little bit different. I would just touch on here in North America from other countries, maybe in Europe or Asia, given that we're a relatively resource rich country, uh, we're a country that has a very wide geography with a relatively mm -hmm. low population density. And so the drivers for a circular economy transition in North America are, are a little bit different uh, or you know look different, I would say, than some of those other jurisdictions. Our industrial base is a little bit different. 
the scarcity of resources is probably less likely to be our primary motivation here in North America. And instead, we can look at areas like innovation in bioeconomy or as uh, Carolyn touched on critical minerals and metals. How do we um, make sure we're um, stewarding those materials and getting them back into the supply chain at the end of uh, end of life? And uh, really looking at areas like secondary manufacturing and remanufacturing as, as growth areas. The low population density and geography here in North America also creates sort of unique challenges in terms of the cost of doing business and, and the investments that we need to support, you know, the required infrastructure and service delivery models for a circular economy. And that sort of infrastructure gap that's often sort of insufficient uh, in the ability to sort of recapture materials and, and make it cost effective does create some opportunities to sort of leapfrog into new areas like uh, reuse and repair um, and sort of enhanced uh, focus areas in, in advanced recycling. I'd also say just to touch on that our um, policy landscape is is somewhat uh, unique too, and that we've got the federal government angle, we've got the states and provinces that also have different jurisdictions, and then the local governments and and their bylaws and their uh, sort of capacity, I guess, to regulate and and develop policy that is often tricky to align and harmonize both even within our countries uh, and cross border for trade and other considerations. So those are all some of the sort of considerations that we have to think about when we're at the starting place of, of the transition to a more circular economy. And just to add to what Bill opened with, um, with the comment about how do we transition from waste to sort of more circular practices, it's probably uh, by starting to refer less to the concept of waste altogether and really thinking about it as that resource and designing out waste and pollution from all of our products and services right from the beginning. And then looking at those drivers like collaboration and innovation and investment to move the dial. Great. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. And in fact, one of the, the topics we can explore uh, in our conversation a little bit later on is again, how uh, countries like Canada have taken a real leadership role, even though historically there's been a strong economic dependence on uh, primary materials and resource extraction. Uh, so, so good on you uh, for taking the lead there. Um, and now we're uh, taking our, our circle, uh, making it a little bit wider from the U.S. to, to North America. And now we're going to go all the way to the other side of the world very early in the morning uh, to Malaysia. And Kinesin, if you can tell us a little bit more about uh, your, your point of view. And again, Malaysia, really interesting uh, context of being both resource, resource rich as well as resource constraint. Yeah, thank you, Morning to everyone. Uh, I, I'll take it. I'll take it from Carolyn's uh, viewpoint of uh, going back to the economy, supply and demand. So we we are in the space. We are in manufacturing. We are in resource. Uh, we are in property man, property development. We are in the full gamut of issues, right? So looking at the supply and demand situation today, we have a huge supply of waste. There's no demand. So we are in, in the space of uh, driven by the strong initiatives globally on the ESG platform. So that's driving a lot of uh, businesses across Asia, and particularly in Malaysia, because of capital demands, right? So now we are in this space of circular economy. So we have taken a stand that there is a lot of supply in terms of this um, waste. And we are particularly zooming into two things. One is the, the plastic waste. Which is standard, uh, which in the past few years has been dumped from the Western world in Asia. That's a fact. So what do we do about it? We become a, a situation where can we be a conduit to make this waste as our resource supply? Now we are working with several young industries in the country and across the region to uh, who have successfully done small and medium scale businesses to get into the global markets through our own invent, uh, incentives and also collaboration and uh, probably joint ventures to take them and scale them up and bring them to the marketplace. We can provide the platform to get them to the global scale. Now, that's what we can do. You know, that's rather than greenwashing, we want to get into the space of really being the significant change and significant contributor to that. that, that that's, that's generally what we, we are targeting. 
And you will, over the few months, hear about some of the initiatives that we're doing. In, pa in particularly, we are uh, just to share the experience that uh, this ESG compliance uh, does have a material impact on how businesses make decisions out here. And that's driving a lot. Having said that, I was talking to you, Caroline, and uh, earlier. Uh, I am in a global company uh, out uh, hotel, and th this the, the recycling campaign. I, I think the root of it, we need to go back to look at the laws that that's been implemented across, and the, really the compliance is something that we are letting go. It's not enough. So if you're going to talk about circular economy and keep that going. Uh, it has to work all the way through. It cannot just be on 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 uh, capital punishing industries, whereas uh, compliance is now left to certain areas. Now, you know, in the past few months, we have had uh, past two years, we've got a, a, quite a lot of compliance issue on our glove manufacturers, right? Now, and that 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 yes, great capital, but again, it is sporadic and topical this in compliance issue. So I think if ESG and circular economy has got to work, it's got to be a comprehensive, it's got to be whole, it's got to be really trackable, it's got to be something that the markets can accept as well and quickly and easily implemented. I welcome Caroline, I think it's great uh, to, to, to know that uh, all this transparency is put out there and we can all access it. And I think the education part of it got to also be pushed a bit more. Uh, the circular economy, again, going back to supply and demand. Uh, I think that's where, uh, fantastically put, is the gap that we need to to to, to uh, address. That's my viewpoint. Right. Thanks, guys. And in fact, since since you're you're one of our key points of view on innovation, I don't know if you can just tell us a little bit more about how you are innovating uh, in uh, construction, demolition, waste, closing the loop on, on that, um, uh, and uh, uh, also on, on the plastics part. Uh, taking waste plastics and turning that into uh, construction materials. Yeah. So um, one of the things that we get to market is that we we'll, we're going to take plastics to become affordable homes, right? Um, These uh, prototypes are already ready and they're going to be launched over the next uh, um, 24 months. But in the next 12 months, you will see a significant impact. Now, that's not just for Malaysia. Now, we are telling the European markets where there's a big, problem to manage plastics uh, and it's being dumped okay this is a reality and i mean that's a big elephant in the room let's address it we will welcome this plastic to be done as our our commodity resource to uh, and, and and become a product that can be delivered again this is for the global markets we can go back to uh, africa and uh, places where dire need for building materials at a very affordable uh, cost. And that's where the circular thing gets close. The supply comes from plastics or from Europe. The the funding comes from the Europeans. And then, I, I'm not picking up the Europeans, but I'm just taking an example. So, and the, the, the product, end product goes back as a circular support system for the global market. So we have a complete that. And in the building materials, we are doing, we are using slags uh, and converting the slags into, um, instead of becoming a pure waste and laying in the ground and so on, into building materials, into uh, compounding them into that. So we've got, a, we've got a, a team of people that look at it. We're going to go upscale it higher. We're going to really focus having a team of uh, combining all the backroom operations from road maintenance to cement to, uh, to building materials, have a center that would be able to cater for it. Now, we, we, we are working with the National uh, Research Institute in Malaysia called CIRM. Uh, they are also driving it. So there's a lot of initiatives happening, and we hope to tag on to, to the global market initiatives as well. Very cool. I, I was at Thank CIRM uh, in uh, 2017. I was really, really uh, impressed. Um, yeah, and, and I like, Kinesin, you also how uh, you, you uh, are looking at uh, weight, waste, uh, as materials. And so I, I think, you know, waste has that kind of uh, mental model of framework saying, oh, I want to get rid of this thing versus no, these are materials with valuable properties and we just need to treat them as any other material. Yeah. So that's very helpful. Supply, supply yeah. and demand. Yeah. 
And uh, uh, you know, sadly, we have a big supply, as you pointed out, on, on waste, particularly plastic waste. Um, and Kanesan, you, you made a comment that's a perfect segue uh, into talking with uh, Toshihiro. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the ESG uh, performance aspects have real uh, tangible implications, particularly when it comes to financing. Uh, so uh, Toshihiro, you have a lot of experience uh, as an investor uh, across Asia. Uh, tell us how you see things. Uh, okay. Well, uh, my name is Tosh uh, uh, Toshihiro. Uh, I'm CEO of Mercury Investment, uh, which is doing the uh, cross-border investment. Uh, prior to Mer uh, setting up Mercury Investment, I was with the World Bank and also worked uh, for some, the banking uh, finance industry in Japan. Uh, well, through the finance, uh, where it touches uh, various uh, aspects uh, of the recycling, uh, for, well, when I was with the bank back in Japan, I was in charge of the project finance of the nu nuclear fuel recycling, which is quite uh, problematic. And uh, well, of course, uh, actually, even today, people do not know what the entire life cost of the nuclear fuel, uh, including the back end. Uh, but uh, it has to be charged and shifted onto the uh, electricity cost. A tariff. Uh, during uh, World Bank, uh, I was not. I, I was mainly engaged in African privatization, so uh, not very much in environment. But one of my friends was in charge of um, <clears throat> carbon credit uh, mechanism under the the Kyoto mechanism, Kyoto Protocol, uh, which uh, I, I I saw that um, Japanese government or the Japanese electricity industry had contributed a lot of money. But eventually, all the carbon credit fund uh, eventually uh, failed. Uh, uh, they they couldn't have the accountability. Uh, it is so difficult to trace uh, what was not being used or what what has been saved. Uh, um, after quitting World Bank, I set up the cross border investment fund, which is market nowadays, and I invested in various things. And uh, this is a little bit closer to Kanesan's uh, viewpoint that uh, uh, in China, uh, China is uh, was was already the uh, economic power uh, in terms of production and growth. But at the same time, the the flip side of the growth uh, is the pollution. So uh, we invested uh, into the the wastewater treatment uh, businesses uh, in, in in China. Uh, in terms of technology, uh, membrane is very important technology for the wastewater treatment, and we brought in the uh, uh, the uh, the chemical companies uh, membrane technology from Japan into China to uh, <clears throat> enhance the efficiency of their water treatment. Uh, and also, we have invested in some uh, real estate property uh, in the center of Beijing. Uh, we still manage them, but um, uh, what surprised me is that uh, maybe around uh, the timing of Beijing Olympic, uh, the, the PM 2.5 uh, was a big, big issue. Uh, nobody could see, well, uh, the, the, maybe Los Angeles in 1970s or something like that. Uh, people can look through maybe 500 meters. You cannot see the, see the object. Uh, and, and the entire city was covered with the smoke. But uh, if you go to Beijing, you will be surprised. It's very clean and blue sky everywhere. Well, actually, uh, I, I, I realize the processes uh, because uh, we do manage a, 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 a one, one uh, relatively big uh, property over there. Uh, so one day, uh, Beijing, Beijing government just uh, sent us the order to, to, to switch the energy sources. So, uh, and, and, and uh, we did, of course, we didn't use coal, but uh, but but uh, it, it cost a big amount of investment. Um, but it was just an order uh, coming from the government. So, uh, I, I, I think uh, I, uh, as the introduction, Bill made very uh, great 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 framework and. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, carrying, uh, setting the, the U, 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 U.S. case and, uh, uh, U.S. challenge. And, and Paul gave the, that uh, policy investment, um, <clears throat> um, uh, collaboration, innovation, uh, that kind of framework. But, um, maybe what I would like to put here is that, uh, 
uh, the issue of the pollution or the environment, that, that kind of thing is coming again and again and again. We have seen repeated pattern or, of course, everybody can easily agree what we have to do. And of course, the smaller the better, and do you think that the, the, the waste is better? That we know, but uh, the reality is it, 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 it's increasing forever. And, and there has been repeated initiatives. Uh, we, we try to challenge and, and a significant money uh, put into that, but uh, uh, somehow uh, it has not been very sustainable, but, but, but improving, but not sustainable, not catching up to the speed of the economic development. Or, 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 or maybe it is very difficult to control the Chinese people with 1.4 billion population who want to uh, have the better life, unlike in the US. Maybe Indians may think in that way as well. So uh, if everybody wants to have the better life, uh, what, what happens? So uh, Paul mentioned that uh, Canada is uh, our US are resource rich. Uh, to the contrary, uh, Japan has been known for very uh, scarce of the resources. So uh, in Japan, we have had a long history of motainai, how to live small, reduce the consumption. And that comes first. But uh, it's been seen as a kind of economic motivation. Well, you are poor, so you are not using much. Uh, we are rich, but uh, we are tackling the usage, recycling, so it's justice. Uh, what's the justice? Uh, the definition is very difficult. So. So I, I think it also involves a lot of cultural aspect. So uh, the point I would like to make is definition, uh, the target, uh, currently plastic is important, but of course nuclear waste or for the battery, uh, rare metal, if you go to African countries where rare metal uh, is uh, extracted, uh, you will be very, uh, feel very depressed. Um, uh, or in China as well. So, so uh, definition. What, 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 what's going to be the target? I, I, I think the list is adding uh, each time or being changed each time, and uh, the traceability or tracking, uh, and, and and tracking what has been used is relatively easy, but what has not been used is so difficult. Accountants say they can do that, but they are saying that for their own profit. Uh, and enforcement. Enforcement uh, is definitely needed. And of course, uh, 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 engagement is a nice word. Uh, we like that. Uh, and and, and I, I, I really want to have myself being engaged in these activities. And, uh, and it's almost being enforced by the United Nations to, to, for ESG, SDG, <laughs> which is a nice thing. But the United Nations does not work, just like uh, we, we see what's ha happening between Ukraine and, and Russia. So, but uh, I, I think to some extent enforcement is needed, but uh, like the case I mentioned about Beijing, that kind of enforcement, is that enforcement we, we want or not? Uh, so uh, it's more authoritarian and, and it's just an order. But once they set the target, they can clean up immediately. Uh, is it good or bad? What's the justice? So mm -hmm. uh, there is a lot of cultural aspect behind that. And finally, one thing I would like to point out is the jurisdiction. Uh, I, I, I think uh, U.S. is pretty much independent. Uh, individual comes first, municipality, county, and state, and federal. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, so controlling the people's activity from the federal level is like the dropping the eye drop uh, from the second story, uh, uh, second floor. So, uh, but um, uh, it has to be done. Uh, and uh, uh, in the investment area, uh, we do have the recently some people are talking about investment mileage. What it means is uh, uh, the, 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 the cost and benefit or, or some kind of investment. Uh, uh, we have been talking about the global integration and cross-border is something very important under WTO. I was with World Bank and I was promoting that. But uh, once uh, people get too apart, uh, people start to not to feel what's happening on the other other side. So so ma ma making the responsibility and, and, and the activity uh, a little bit closer, uh, ma ma uh, raise the consciousness uh, or, or if you... Uh, so, so uh, Canadians are uh, uh, 
case of, of treating the plastic waste worldwide is good in one way, but at the same time, it's just removing the, 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 some, something you do not want to see from Europe or Japan to the other part of the country. So, so uh, should it be treated more locally or not? So that kind of thing. So it involves yeah. cultural, and but uh, eventually we need to change. So some kind of enforcement is needed in a in 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 a uh, 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 more more uh, collaborative way. Yeah, yeah that's great. Right Thank you. So so what what great examples um, of again kind of the forward to the past. You know, looking at uh, Japan as as resource constrained uh, over most of its history um, and uh, doing more with, with less materials. Uh, but Caroline, I want to send it uh, over to you. So if you had the power of uh, Chinese central government. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, 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 uh, said that um, you know, from one day to the next, to say, well, you're going to uh, switch your fuels. Um, if, if you had that power, uh, how would you like to change things? Uh, in, uh, that's uh, interesting. Uh, waste perspective? <laughs> wow, that's a, that's a great question. And I think completely unrealistic. <laughs> Potential uh, future, um, but uh, I, I think there's so much that we need to figure out the answers to. Frankly, uh, Paul talked about uh, geographically dispersed, you know, low population density areas. We have low population density areas, and we have super high population density areas, and the the waste stream challenges in those two areas are completely different, um, right? I, I live in the Washington, D.C. area. We are crowded on top of each other all over the place here. I went on vacation in a state that I won't, uh, I won't say because I don't want to embarrass them, um, but I went to get rid of my recycling during my vacation and they didn't take glass because glass was too heavy to transport and it was gonna cost mm. too much um, to transport the glass. And it, it broke my heart to put a glass bottle in the trash can knowing how <laughs> recyclable glass is. But the, the challenges faced in more rural areas are completely different from the challenges faced in our urban areas. And so I, I don't even know where to start answering your question, uh, Bill, because um, <laughs> it, there's, there are so many challenges out there. And I will also say education is is going to be a really challenging aspect of this as well uh so that you know we 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 have a twitter account at epa and when we put out our national recycling strategy we got some feedback on twitter and people said how am i supposed to know how to recycle everything uh my community recycles differently from the community in the mm -hmm. county next door mm -hmm. right which is uh, part of what you were talking about um so there's there's just so many challenges facing us and i think that's why we really want everyone who's interested to sign up to help us figure out how to address all these challenges it's going to take industry in the design of products it's going to take citizens and community members in in complying with uh recycling to getting educated uh, it's going to take governments at the tribal local state and federal level to all work together so gosh um there's, there's so much to do Right. Yeah, certainly uh, this is a, a system issue. And so it takes a, a whole of society approach. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'd like to say it was, you know, the Biden administration, there's so many things that are the whole of government approach. And it is nice to see things like uh, the Federal Trade Commission coming up with its ruling last, last mm -hmm. July for right to repair. Uh, so that obviously um, uh, reduces the, the amount of waste, particularly such as, you know, electronic waste or um, looking at uh, vehicles or other uh, capital goods. Uh, being wasted um, and kind of changing the whole uh, flow for the last 200 years where we've tried to make things as cheap as possible to buy. Mm. Uh, and so we have to get the scale. We have to ship uh, manufacturing to cheap lab labor uh, uh, locales across the, the world instead of making things inexpensive uh, to get value from. So again, if we can shift more towards a, a service mentality of like, why did I want that capital good in the first place? Was well, to get some you know value from that. Um, if we can shift that mentality, uh, then I think we can work with the, the economics, as you were pointing out earlier, uh, to get that cost down. So we actually end up with lower impacts uh, and be able to provide uh, a more equity in the provision of services, which gets back to the whole question of like being prosperous. Everybody 
wants to be prosperous, deserves to be prosperous. But I think, again, getting back to the cultural um, uh, notes that were mentioned earlier, uh, we, I think, particularly in the West, and particularly in the United States, have linked prosperity with consumption. And as you know, Asia, in particular like Southeast Asia, uh, where Canadian is, uh, they're kind of following a U.S. model and they are consuming more. So in addition to the, the waste that has been dumped in the past you know, from the industrialized world on the, on the developing world, there's also this mountain of waste that, that's coming up from greater consumption in the emerging markets. So uh, there's definitely, you know, as they say, between Scylla and Charybdis, you're, you're in a difficult spot in emerging markets. Uh, but I really like Kinesin's approach to saying, well, this is also an opportunity. Uh, hmm. How do we seize that? I did want to throw out a question, and, and uh, so and perhaps Carolyn and, and Paul, you can uh, address this, uh, around extended producer responsibility. Is, is that a lever? So again, if we had, uh, we don't necessarily have the Chinese government, would you say if, if we had uh, policy yeah. authority <laughs> over the United States or any country, uh, where would extended producer responsibility or EPR uh, fit in? Would that be a top priority or somewhere in the middle or not a priority at all? So first, uh, Carolyn, then Paul. Sure. And that's a great question. So my office is actually doing a series of studies that we uh, will be putting out in draft over the coming year. And one of them is looking at policies and really evaluating the effectiveness of different policies that different jurisdictions have used. And I'm I'm really excited to see that study come out because I think the more that we can get evidence about the real impacts of some of these policies, the more we can advocate for the ones that really work. And I think there's a lot of interest around extended pursuit responsibility. I think there are a lot more people talking about that as a viable option than there have been in years past. And so I'm very much looking forward to seeing what our study comes out to say about that as a policy and, and other policies. That uh, The benefit of having local jurisdictions all try different things is that we have a a variety of experiments that we can look at and see what has worked at, at different jurisdictions and, and advocate for that to be used more widely. That's great. And having a data driven approach, uh, so that makes a lot of sense. Paul, what, what's your point of view? Yeah, I live in British Columbia where, you know, this province has, has been an early adopter and, and maybe a leader on extended producer responsibility, other um, and that's where it sits in terms of jurisdictional control is at the provincial level here in Canada. We're seeing, uh, you know, Ontario are moving forward with it and Alberta slowly catching on. Um, you know, it's been in place for a long time dealing with hazardous materials or things like tires, stewardship programs. And, you know, it's it's created, I guess, two two opportunity areas. One in terms of, uh, you know, bringing those materials back into the supply chains and, and upcycling and looking for new opportunities for those resources so they're not lost at the end of, end of life. And secondly, helping ideally when they're set up properly to have industry rethink how they're actually designing these products in the first place because it shifts the cost of managing those materials away from government and local governments, et cetera, to the industry themselves. And, and it should shift the way they think about designing those products so they can be recycled or repurposed or, or brought back in at the end of life. Um, so, I mean, it's a it's a critical tool, but it's just one of the tools, as Carolyn was saying, in the toolbox. Um, and, you know, it needs to be there, but, you know, you have to think about how it works with other types of regulation and incentive-based programs. And back to the point around demand, I think super important to think about the role of procurement, both from the, the consumer side, but also the role that industry and government play in driving the demand through levers like procurement for, you know, the matching the, the supply and demand gap. Are we for me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So very quickly, I think uh, uh, I think markets also punish uh, uh, environments for 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 the lack of uh, enforcement, and therefore, if you look at Asian example, Boroke, uh, Phuket, and Komodo Island, uh, they, Boroke just shut down for a year. I mean, it's unthinkable that the people give up their economy for a year to clean up. Uh, Komodo Island, but Komodo Island was uh, driven by the government as well. But these are people right at the forefront of economic survival that gave up so that the environment can be resusc resuscitated because of the longer term impact. I think these are things that we also need to push um, uh, while we are talking about the circular economy. This is part and parcel of this. This is where the consumption needs to be punished. 
Sorry, but we need to do that. If you are going to, uh, we have an island here called Sipadan, uh, which is one of the world's best diving. Uh, uh, diving. You take back every waste you bring. You are responsible for, you are bringing, you know, you, and you can't bring. Uh, so th this is where the enforcement starts at the, at, the, at, the, at the level. While we are talking about circular economy, yes, but we also need to get down to the grassroots of, you know, I collected uh, plastic bottles on the beach and I come back to the resort and there's no recycling. You know, so what is it for me as a consumer? I, I feel disappointed, right? So this is again enforcement across the globe has to go right, right down to the bottom at the point where the plastic waste comes back or any other waste comes back. There will, a lot more needs to be done there as well into yeah. the secular economy. Excellent. Well, we are actually at, at time now, but I, I think there's a lot of optimism uh, across um, all of us here in an interesting uh, collaboration we was talking about earlier between the, the private sector, uh, which is arguably leading around the world, similar to um, uh, leading in, in the climate areas, uh, and then working with, with public sectors uh, and uh, learning from our own experiences, learning from our own data, uh, and then learning from ourselves across the world. So thanks uh, each and every one of you for, for joining us today, and we'll see you later. And Take Bill, care. thank you for pulling us together. Sure. All Great right. conversation. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.